This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hey, this is Jason Crowell from Norton Neuroscience Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. Thanks for listening to the Neurology Podcast today. Today, we have Campbell Leheron joining us. Campbell is a neurologist and cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Otago. And we're talking about a paper today that he and his co-authors recently had published in the journal Neurology. It was published June 25th. The title of this paper is Cross-Sectional and Longitudinal Association of Clinical and Neurocognitive Factors with Apathy in Patients with Parkinson's Disease. Campbell, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here. This is something that comes up a lot in clinic, right? We see patients in clinic with Parkinson's disease, and we talk about the motor symptoms, we talk about mood and behavioral symptoms, and frequently apathy is something that they mention as as a symptom. Before we get into the paper today, how would you define apathy? When, When you're talking to patients in clinic and they talk about apathy, what is it that you understand them to mean when they say they feel apathetic? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And I think your observation as well, apathy is one of those things that certainly I think when you're a junior doctor coming through, you probably don't think about too much when you're on the wards dealing with acute inpatients. But once you start seeing people in the outpatient setting and the things that actually are affecting their life on an ongoing basis and a day-to-day basis, this lack of motivation or apathy very much comes to the forefront. And it's one of those things, almost the more you look for it, the more that you find it. There's lots of ways that it's been defined, but essentially, in my mind, apathy is a reduction in motivation that manifests in reduced goal-directed behavior compared to what a person was before they had whatever we think is causing that. So essentially, it's apathetic people are doing less. And in the research sort of world, it is sometimes thought about in, in different domains. So you can be apathetic towards social behaviors or cognitive you know, challenges or just getting up off the couch and things. But I think it's easier maybe conceptually just to keep it at that sort of level of just a reduction in goal-directed behavior. And I should know the answer to this, Campbell, but I assume that this is related to just insufficient amounts of dopamine. I I assume that this is just another manifestation of not enough dopamine in folks with Parkinson's. Is that accurate? Oh, it'd be wonderful if it was that simple. (laughs) And uh, it would be great at treating it and we're not. And uh, yeah, that's been a really prominent hypothesis. And and it makes sense in the context of Parkinson's disease, where we know that the dopaminergic system is one of the modulatory systems that's very much affected early on and gives rise to a lot of the symptoms we associate closely with Parkinson's. But the simple truth is actually, unfortunately, replacing dopamine, although it can help for some people, is not the cure for this problem in a lot of people. The way we think about apathy is that it's a sort of some sort of disruption of the mechanisms that underlie goal-directed behavior. And particularly, probably the way the brain is weighing up the rewarding outcomes of potential actions against the costs of those actions, which is a process we often refer to as effort-based decision-making. And in some way, this has been perturbed. And there's probably multiple different ways that system of reward network can be affected that can lead to this sort of common phenotype of reduced goal-directed behavior. And for some people, we think that is a reduction in the dopaminergic axis, probably particularly what we call the mesolimbic axis, so the ventral striat, so that, sorry, the ventral tegmental area projecting through to the ventral striatum and up to the anterior cingulate cortex, a sort of loop which is a little bit different to the dorsal loop we associate with a lot of our, our motor symptoms in PD. But unfortunately, it, it isn't that simple. And mo- there's many other military systems that play into things as well, as we might get onto a bit later. Actually, probably one of the most protective treatments in Parkinson's and also dementia with Lewy bodies is cholinesterase inhibitors, so boosting acetylcholine rather than dopamine levels. So it's, it's complicated, <laughs> unfortunately. So when you're in clinic and you're seeing patients, if they don't volunteer this, do you have ways to tease this, this out, whether or not they're experiencing apathy? I think it is. And I think it's a really important thing to ask because not everybody has insight into their apathy as well. Often their partners will. So I think it is a, an important thing to bring up if it's not volunteered. Particularly early on, and it can be actually a really helpful sign when other things are a little bit equivocal and you're trying to figure out there is a degenerative process going on or not. Pragmatically, the sorts of things I usually ask is just, have you lost your motivation or your drive to do things? I make sure I look at both the patient and also their partner or whoever's accompanied them, because often there can be quite impressive discrepancies between what people think around that. If that doesn't bring anything and I'm a bit suspicious, just I might ask something like, what do you like doing? And just get a bit of a feel for what their day looks like. And you can get that 
in 30 seconds or so. And it actually is quite helpful for building up a picture of a person anyway in terms of the management. If they do say that they've lost their motivation a bit, I would usually follow that up with something like, why don't you do things? Because I think that's interesting. And people have, a range, say, a range of things, but it's often things like, I just can't be bothered or it doesn't seem worth it. Sometimes people say that they're just not sure why they're not doing things. Probably the other thing I think is important when you're asking about this loss of motivation is to get a sense of enjoyment as well, what we think of as anhedonia. And we often think about the sort of wanting, so that they're being prepared to work towards a goal or something rewarding, and then the actual hedonic enjoyment when you interact with that goal. And often in a classical apathy, actually that enjoyment is still there. So people will still like doing things. They just can't be bothered getting to them, if that makes sense. So I often try and tease that out a little bit as well. So almost saying it's not that the goal isn't desirable, it's that the cost of getting there has increased for some reason. That's what we think at some level. Although actually when we've done in other work, we've actually looked into this a little bit, dissociating the effects of reward and effort, for example, on people's willingness to pursue goals. And it does seem that lower rewards don't incentivize people as much in Parkinson's. So that's why it's not worth it, if that makes sense. So you and your colleagues were seeking to better understand apathy in folks with Parkinson's and you had a collection of patients and gather some data. Can you give us the overview of the study? Yeah. As a background, we've spent a lot of time investigating the mechanisms around apathy, but actually we haven't got a very good picture of what apathy looks like at a, just an epidemiological level across the course of Parkinson's disease. Really, it hasn't been studied to a large degree in big longitudinal studies. There have been a few good ones, but in relatively small numbers of people and with relatively short follow-up. So here in Christchurch in New Zealand, we've got this thing called the New Zealand Parkinson's Progression Project, which has been following people with Parkinson's disease diagnosed by movement disorders neurologist for up to 14 years. So what we did in this study is we looked at the neuropsychiatric inventory, which has an apathy-related section in it. So it's a fairly crude measure of apathy, but I think it captures whether someone has lost motivation or not fairly well. So we were able to look at that in 346 people who've been followed for up to 14 years. And we we're able to look at both the cross-sectional associations, which has been done by, by others before. So what in people who've got apathy right now, what features are associated with that? But more importantly, in people who don't have apathy at a given time point, but develop it later, what features predict the development of that across time? The other thing that was really important to do when, when you're doing longitudinal work, you've got to think about what else can happen to people across time. And of course, people can die, and that, that's a pretty big event along the way. And so you need to somehow capture that in your models. So our longitudinal models were what were called a multi-state model, which basically allowed you to look at the likelihood of developing apathy, but also allowing for the competing risk of dying before you had a chance to develop apathy. So what we found with the study, really, first of all, this gave us an estimate of the effect of apathy on actual mortality, so the risk of dying. And we found that at any time point in Parkinson's, if you have apathy, you have a significantly higher risk of passing away before the next sort of time point, so the next over the next couple of years. And that's after controlling for all other factors that are associated with apathy and also death like having an older age or more advanced disease and things like that. So that was a pretty strong signal that I think backs up what we see in the clinic, that this is an important issue for people and their quality of life, but actually as a predictor of death as well, the presence of apathy was important. And the next thing in terms of the longitudinal aspect was the predictors and people who had normal motivation. What was it that predicted the development of future apathy? And we found that higher levels of depressive symptoms lower cognition and also to a degree higher motor severity all predicted development of apathy down the line in people who currently had normal motivation. So that was interesting, I think. And there's potential, there's two ways you can think about each of those points in terms of how they could lead to apathy. So there could be some sort of crossover. So for example, with depressive symptoms, we know if you think about depression, it's actually a whole lot of different things going on probably. And there's lots of different ways of being depressed. And we alluded earlier, I think, to the fact that depression, that the anhedonic component of depression, that sort of wanting and liking probably does overlap with apathy and probably has a neurobiological overlap as well. So it may be that similar systems, particularly reward network systems, are being 
affected and manifesting initially as depression, but then down the line as apathy. But of course, it's also possible that if you're more depressed, it puts you into a state where you're more likely to lose motivation. And maybe you end up in a poorer environment, you have less social contacts, less cognitive stimulation, all these sorts of factors. And I think that's really important because these are things that theoretically we could change and identify. If we effectively manage these sorts of problems early, we may be able to prevent to a degree this loss of motivation down the line. And it's really a similar story around the cognitive aspects as well. I think the other really important point that came out of the study was that the prevalence, so the likelihood of having apathy at any particular point on the Parkinson's disease course was actually stable. So it wasn't that it just grew across time, for example, as we see in Huntington's disease, but actually whether you've just been diagnosed or whether you have 12 years down the line, the proportion of people who had apathy was about the same. That doesn't mean that the causes of apathy at this different stages of Parkinson's is the same, and it could be quite different. It's, we could think of different factors that might lead to perturb this you know, underlying system of goal-directed behaviour at different stages of the disease. But it does say that this is something we need to think about in our Parkinson's patients across the disease course. Were you surprised, Campbell, that the occurrence of apathy did not change throughout the disease course? I don't know why, but I would have guessed that it would have increased the longer someone had the disease. I don't know why. That's my intuition, but that's what I would have guessed. Were you surprised that it didn't change? I wasn't actually, and this was actually one of our motivations for doing the work, because in some reviews of, of apathy, it's still presented as something that's a late stage feature. You just have to see people with Parkinson's disease, and you know that a proportion of people are coming into your clinic with maybe a slight tremor and they've slowed up a bit, but it's their motivation that's dropped away as a profound early symptom. And so it definitely is something across the disease course. The other thing we have to realize, although there are factors that are associated with apathy, like reduced cognition, which clearly increased across Parkinson's, because apathy is associated with an increased risk of mortality, that could in part lead to stable group prevalence rates across time. So if for whatever reason people with apathy are across the disease course dying a little bit quicker, then that may, to a degree anyway, account for the increase that you see as, for example, cognitive decline occurs. It's really interesting. You know, I'm sure we, we have clinicians who listen to this podcast and, and take care of folks with Parkinson's day in and day out. And the question that I'm interested in is when you see folks with Parkinson's who, who say, yes, I've, I'm, I've lost motivation. I just don't have any drive to go and do these things. How do you counsel them? Do you have any recommendations for managing this? This is a really important question. And again, it's not easy because we don't have something that works reliably for everyone. I think the starting point is education, actually. I think explaining to people what apathy is, that it's not that they're lazy. Sure, they may say things that I can't be bothered, but this is caused by an intrinsic change in the way their brain is representing reward and um, costs of doing things. So they've had this it's a disease, essentially, that is changing the way the goal-directed behavior systems within the brain. And I think explaining that is helpful. Even if it doesn't change what's happening, at least people can conceptualize it in a slightly different way. Particularly for partners, I think that can be really useful. I think at a non-pharmacological approach, there are things that can help. Sometimes it is that if you can identify with people that they still enjoy doing things, they just can't be bothered working towards them. You can maybe set up an idea for people that some external cueing, whether that's like alarms and things like that, or actually just a bit of nagging and a bit of a push to get out the door because you will enjoy it once you're doing it. So that kind of encouragement to just keep pushing, essentially, obviously in an appropriate way, I think that can be quite helpful as well. Um, from the pharmacological side, I think it's definitely worth trying. But I think you've got to realize that most of these treatments are off-label in terms of treatment for apathy. There are some randomized controlled trials that have shown a positive effect, particularly for cholinesterase inhibitors, so denepazil or rivastigmine, and the treatment of apathy, both in Parkinson's and also dementia with Lewy body. What I tend to do is I'll think a bit about the company that apathy is keeping. And we've alluded earlier to the dopaminergic axis, and these people have Parkinson's disease, so that is a natural place to start. You're going to be replacing dopamine. And I think we, you'd do that in your normal sort of way. Interestingly, in the cross-sectional aspects of the study, there was a suggestion that apathy was associated with a reduced levodopa dose, but not with motor severity, which could maybe suggest that, for example, people who have apathy the dose that you need to treat their motor symptoms isn't enough as much as the dose that's required to potentially that uh, mesolimbic dopaminergic axis. So you could potentially push dopamine a little bit higher. And that's where uh, dopamine agonists, there has been some evidence for using them, obviously with the, the potential drawbacks as well. 
So the dopaminergic access is certainly one to consider, but I have a pretty low threshold to start a cholinesterase inhibitor. If there's a sniff of attentional difficulties, memory difficulties, or visual hallucinations, then I'd certainly be leaning pretty strongly towards commencing one of these because often people do feel quite a, an energization and a boost from that. The other things to think about, I think, if there is the setting of fatigue or effortfulness with doing things, and so if it does feel it's more in that realm, then I think considering the noradrenergic type medications, or at least, which often will have a mixed dopaminergic effect as well. So that's things that include methylphenidate, which actually does have some reasonable evidence for the treatment of apathy in Alzheimer's disease. But other things, so even things like modafinil could be potentially, although again, I think it's important to talk with people that this really is not proven at a, a scientific level. It's a bit anecdotal. The main other modulatory system that I'd consider is the serotonergic one. There's mixed evidence, for example, with SSRIs and animal models of this idea when we look at this, this concept of effort-based decision-making, so how um, reward and efforts are traded off. Sometimes, actually, SSRIs seem to worsen that kind of trade-off and make animals less likely to exert effort for reward. But there's, I think in a human model, if there is significant depression, certainly, then that's a worthwhile thing to try and treat. And then there are some other serotonergic medications that bind to slightly different receptor classes that have actually been shown to be effective, for example, in frontotemporal dementia, although not to my knowledge in Parkinson's disease. So there's a medication called agomelatine that targets a slightly different sort of constellation of receptors to the traditional SSRI. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. I think what you want to do is to talk to people about this situation. You go and just discuss that, let's try this thing. If this doesn't work, we could maybe try this. It really is a bit of a team approach in that setting. Oftentimes when I talk to patients about this, I do frequently think about the dopaminergic system because sometimes when I'm trying to tease out, is this apathy? I wonder, is it apathy or is it just it's effortful to move, right? So if someone has slowness and stiffness and they appear even a little bit undertreated, it's maybe they're just undertreated and it's not necessarily apathy. Maybe it's more of a, it's effortful to move. And, and so I don't move as much and I don't do the things I normally would, but it takes more energy to do those things. And I think you've got to start with targeting those motor symptoms and particularly if they're not adequately improved. Because as you say, if that's not working, it, it becomes harder to really understand that the broader motivated behavior aspects of things, or at least the higher level. So absolutely, I think still targeting that dopaminergic axis is important. That does remain one of the pillars, I think, of goal-directed behavior. And there's a huge amount of literature across all sorts of different levels of neuroscience looking at this. But I think the problem is that just targeting that often doesn't fix apathy, for certainly for a reasonable proportion of our patients. And like everything that we find with the brain, it's more complex than a single neurotransmitter, unfortunately. I really appreciate you and your colleagues working on this. It's very interesting. Again, the title of the paper is Cross-Sectional and Longitudinal Association of Clinical and Neurocognitive Factors with Apathy in Patients with Parkinson's Disease. It was published in Neurology on June 25th. And once again, I've been speaking with Campbell Leheron from the University of Otago. Campbell, thanks so much for joining us this week. We really appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you for having me, Jason. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.